If you compare the size and shape of city blocks across the US, you'll quickly notice a couple standouts, like how long and narrow a block in New York is, or how small a block in Carson City is. But the one that stands out most to me is the size of a block in Salt Lake City, Utah. This is the largest city block in the country and maybe the world. It's not just the city blocks that are massive. The streets here are so wide that they give us these bright flags so that we can cross them safely. At 132 feet wide, these are the widest streets in the United States. I mean, look at this. They're freaking huge. But when I started looking into why the blocks and streets are like this, I found that it was inseparably linked to the reason the city was built here in the first place. If a city is more than just an accidental accumulation of people, if there's a degree of intentionality about it at all, its location within a larger landscape, the design of the streets and blocks, all of those things say something about the people who live there. So while the map of Salt Lake City might just look like a simple grid, it's unique not only in its proportions, but in the deep spiritual meaning tied to its origin. I am in a very cold, wintry Salt Lake City right now, and I'm on my way to meet up with Stephen Olson, who is a expert in the history of this city and why it is laid out the way it is. And uh, if you wanna join us for this next segment, it's actually for subscribers only. So you're gonna have to subscribe to the channel and actually hit the like button. And then you can join us on this next part of the journey. So do that real quick, I'll give you a second. And let's go. If you're watching this and you're thinking, oh, he should have filmed this in the summer when the weather's nice, so it looked pretty. Yeah, I wish I was too, because it's cold, okay? The story of Salt Lake City is really the story of two separate groups with separate ideals trying to both run this same place. One of them was the settlers, the Mormon settlers, who had a very specific ideal of the social dynamic and how the government would run here being a theocracy, very tied to their religion. And the other was the federal government of the United States who wanted to make this part of the US run like the rest of the United States. And this tension is still evident in the physical layout of the city. That's a beautiful view though, huh? It is. And I think it's not accidental. It's a constant reminder that secular government prevails here. A key figure in the story of Salt Lake City is Brigham Young, the leader and prophet of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or Mormons. In 1847, he led the Mormon pioneers from Illinois across the plains until they came to what is now Immigration Canyon and overlooked the Salt Lake Valley for the first time. And he said the spirit of the Lord came upon him and he is reported to have said, this is the place, drive on. And so this monument uh, may not be in exactly the same spot where Brigham Young had this impression, but it's to celebrate that grand occasion. It's important to understand the goal of the Latter-day Saints, who I'm just gonna refer to as the saints. When they came into the valley, the church was only about 20 years old, and this wasn't the first time they sought out to start a new community. For a whole variety of reasons, including polygamy, each of these settlements failed. They weren't just trying to start a new city, they were trying to establish what they called Zion. And this was an entirely new way of living, where everything was integrated from the social order of their society to the physical layout of their city. There was a sense that uh, they were establishing the kingdom of God, which would transcend, but not destroy the kingdoms, the nations of the earth. And the physical landscape of the Salt Lake Valley held symbolic meaning for this mission, a huge symbol being the Great Salt Lake. One of the saltiest places on the planet, and it's connected to a freshwater lake further south of here by this river. Well, what did they call the river? The River Jordan, or the Western Jordan, to complement the Eastern Jordan in Palestine that connects the Sea of Galilee with the Dead Sea. Beyond religious significance, there was one more advantage, a political one. This is a map of the United States from 1847, and right here is where Brigham Young declared this is the place. The Salt Lake Valley was part of Mexico. And this space was kind of a neutral space between native groups to the north, mostly Shoshones, and native groups to the south, mostly Utes. And so they felt like they could just kind of work their way into and settle this place and, and keep friendly relations with the surrounding native tribes. 
I filmed this video in a very cold, wintry, snowy Salt Lake, and at a time where the Salt Lake Temple is under renovation, so it's covered in scaffolding right now. But I can show you a bunch of footage of beautiful, warm Salt Lake City, Utah, and the temple without the scaffolding, thanks to today's sponsor, Storyblocks. Storyblocks is a website where you can get unlimited stock media for one flat price. Whether you pay monthly or annually, you can get access to their entire library of diverse, high quality 4K footage, or their audio library, or their After Effects templates. They also have plugins for After Effects and Premiere. So just within Premiere, I don't even have to leave my editing software. I can type in Salt Lake City Temple, and boom, I have all the footage that I need to show you guys the centerpiece of this story. I've been using Storyblocks for years, and they've become an essential part of my workflow and process in making these videos. So if you want to get started with unlimited stock media downloads at one flat price, go to storyblocks.com slash Daniel Steiner, or click the link in the description below. Thank you so much to Storyblocks for sponsoring this video, and let's get back to the story of how Salt Lake's map came to be. By settling in the Salt Lake Valley, Brigham Young hoped that they could build enough power and autonomy to have their own territory and run it as they pleased. So construction of their new city began. Four days after his arrival in the desert wilderness, Brigham Young, while walking, suddenly stopped and striking his cane into the parched soil said, here we will build the temple of our God. Before they started laying out the streets, before they did anything, they located the temple, which was the anchor to their new homeland. The reason this was Brigham Young's first order of business is because he was intent on carrying out a very specific urban plan drawn up by Joseph Smith, his predecessor and the founder of the LDS Church. Coming across the plains, he had two documents that were really quite close to him and part of his personal possessions. And one was Joseph Smith's plat for the city of Zion, and the other was Joseph's design of the typical temple for Zion. The plan laid out perfect square blocks with wide straight streets laid in the cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. It marked out one square mile of Joseph Smith's vision for the future city of Zion. At the center of it was the temple. There were a couple versions of the plat of Zion, and this one had 24 temples in the middle, but they all had slightly different purposes. So the temple that we see today kind of takes the place of all of them. So when the pioneers got to the Salt Lake Valley, this is exactly what Brigham Young set out to do. The street widths and block sizes of Salt Lake City are almost precisely what Joseph Smith outlined in the Platte of Zion. And this area, or Platte, is where Brigham Young began. With the temple in the center, all streets indicate their distance from it with their name the streets around it being North, South, East, and West Temple. Then the names of the streets count up by 100 for each block further from the temple they get, succeeded by the accompanying direction. So this would be 100 South, 200 South, 300 South, and so on. So basically, no matter where you find yourself in the city, and not just in the city, but in the whole Salt Lake Valley, you know your distance from the temple based on your address. The beginning of the layout of Salt Lake City as a capital was from the southeast corner of Temple Square. It's commonly said that Brigham Young made the streets so wide so that a horse and wagon could turn around with ease in the street. But when I asked Stephen Olson about it, this is what he said. It had that value, but that was not the purpose, not at all. There were all sorts of, of pragmatic benefits for wide and straight streets. Transportation was one of them. Another one was a fire that plagued many American cities at the time couldn't hop the width of the streets, and so fires were naturally contained. So there were all sorts of pragmatic values, but the primary value was spiritual or symbolic in the sense that it reflected a kind of order and design for the heavenly Zion that he was replicating on Earth so that the two could come together and be united. One thing that will come into play is that Joseph Smith's Plat of Zion and subsequently Brigham Young's plan for Salt Lake City really left no room almost for government buildings. All of the public buildings in Zion were called temples. And over the entrance to these various public buildings was the phrase, holiness to the Lord. The city was designed to be lived in by a theocracy. And that's exactly what they were doing. Brigham Young wasn't only the prophet of the saints but he was also their governor. But if you look closely at the map, you'll actually see that it's a series of grids. Because of rapid immigration, a plat to the east and a plat to the west were added in the same pattern, 
while south of 900 South was designated as the Big Field, which was intended for agricultural purposes, but was later developed into suburbs. This is why the parks in the downtown area conform to the square blocks outlined in the Plat of Zion, while Liberty Park, whose northern end is 900 South, shows the scale of a block in what was the Big Field. And on the north end are the avenues. This is where the foothills interrupt the standard block size. So this became a residential area made up of much smaller blocks. The saints were building the city they envisioned. They had their own currency, they were creating their own language, they were practicing polygamy, and they were physically building the Plat of Zion. But as they were building their city, two major outside factors began to threaten the future of their religious oasis. Only a year after they arrived in the valley, the Mexican-American War ended, resulting in this land now becoming property of the United States. Brigham Young petitioned to have control of this entire area, the whole Great Basin and the Colorado drainage area, and he wanted to call it the State of Deseret. His request was denied, but he was granted this plot of land, the Utah Territory. So basically, it's putting down a, a stake and saying, this is going to be a part of the federal government of the United States, not a theocracy of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That was kind of the beginning point of this tension back and forth that um, probably in some respects is still going on. One of the illustrations of this tension is that the territory of Utah was one of the first territories in the U.S., but the state of Utah was one of the very last states to be admitted to the Union. There's not a point in the, the Latter-day Saint vision that didn't come in some degree of conflict with the secular society of America. From replacing government officials to redrawing land boundaries and water rights, the federal government came into the city set up by a religious group and tried to impose their laws and their standards of urban design onto this already functioning society. When the federal government came out and did the federal land survey, they wanted to start in a different place. And that would have messed up land holdings and transportation routes and all sorts of other things. And finally, the federal government relented and accepted the southeast corner of Temple Square as the origin point of the survey of the, the American West, or at least of the Great Basin. So the reason I'm talking about any of this is because this tension and conflict between the U.S. government and the church that settled Salt Lake City is evident in the physical layout of the map. So if you look at the map, you can see this large area on the eastern side of the city. Today, this is mostly the University of Utah, but it's also Fort Douglas. To much of the United States, this little colony of settlers who had their own way of living and their own militia felt like a threat. So the U.S. ordered a military presence in the Salt Lake Valley. And it's often said that this is the only fortress in the country that is pointing at its city. But apart from political reasons, there's one more thing that changed the character of Salt Lake City forever. In 1869, the Transcontinental Railroad was completed at Promontory Point, not even 50 miles from Salt Lake City. The isolation and theocracy the saints were enjoying was coming to an end as these trains brought in non-Mormon settlers, traders, and miners. And you can still see the main depots that are still part of the urban landscape of Salt Lake City. As the presence of the United States government increased in Salt Lake, the city and county building was constructed intentionally away from Temple Square to shift the center of gravity in the city away from the Mormon Center. Just after this building's completion, the state of Utah was admitted to the Union as the 45th state, and plans for a capital building overlooking the city began. It was positioned on the opposite side of the temple. With the completion of the capital and the renaming of 100 East to State Street, the presence of the federal government now surrounded the religious downtown. And those secular institutions kind of serve as a perimeter around the Mormon <laughs> uh, city of, of Salt Lake City. As the years have gone on, the city has grown dramatically. The LDS population is still very prominent in the city, but it is now the minority. And as more and more people move in from out of state, this tension, especially in regards to church-influenced laws, still is playing out. 
Thank you so much for watching this video. We just passed 20,000 subscribers on this channel, which is crazy. So if you liked this, please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel if you're already subscribed. Thank you so much. It really does mean the world. And please comment, give Steven a thank you for bearing this cold, cold January day with me to teach me about Salt Lake City. Whoa, the storm is coming, yeah, isn't it? it's coming, we're getting cold. We're done. Yep. <laughs>